Hey, friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast. This is the Cathedral of the Rockies, Boise First United Methodist Church. My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to say to you, if you stumbled upon this podcast and you don't have a church, we would be honored to be your church and I'd be honored to be your pastor. Feel free to reach out, shoot an email wherever you are in the country. We can connect, whether it's via Zoom or in person. And I'd love to hear your story. Just email me at pastor at boisefumc.org. Today, we continue the, the series with the gospel, according to the Beatles. And one of the probably fan, most fantastic songs that we think of with the Beatles is Imagine. It asks some hard questions, especially of those of us that are people of faith. Today, we're going to open Imagine. Imagine all the people in the world is one. Imagine. Imagine a community where all people are welcome. Regardless of sexuality or politics or economics or race, imagine. Imagine worship that regularly connects us to God's presence and God's grace that is within us. Imagine a people where anytime there's an opportunity for giving, there's an opportunity for greater joy. Imagine a church. Imagine a church empowered and gifted and equipped to serve the world with passion, meeting the needs of community with grace. Imagine. Imagine a faith, a faith that lives love, a faith that is patient, kind, not rude or boastful or proud, a faith that rejoices in the good, in grace and forgiveness. Imagine living our faith where questions are never too big for a God that's always bigger. Imagine a journey of faith where unique understandings are encouraged, where discussions are alive with beauty and passion of our varied experiences and understanding of the one who cannot be fully understood. Imagine a community where politics works to improve the community for everyone. Imagine a state that builds a government that serves all of its people. Imagine a country where all children have health care and shelter and equal rights under the law. Imagine a people of faith, a people of faith that believe God is so big, they decide they can stay at the table Even when their theologies differ, when their politics differ, when their expression of God differs, imagine a church that changes the world as it impacts the issues of hunger, housing, and health care. Imagine a people who live in justice and mercy and walk humbly with their God. Christianity, our hope is grounded in the ability to imagine the life God offers us and desires us to to participate in. Imagine. A friend of mine said the other day, I can't believe you're going to do a sermon based on imagine this godless song of John Lennon. Don't you know he's an atheist? And I thought, you don't know me. (laughs) Of course I would. Imagine is probably John Lennon's finest moment. It's his yesterday. He wrote this song after the Beatles broke up in his big house in Surrey. Lennon wrote this, we might call it even a hymn to change the world. Pastor Steve Stockman writes this about these lyrics. He says, if the whole song is Lennon's attempt at his own Sermon on the Mount, then that opening line is most iconic of all. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try no hell. Below us, above us, only sky. 
Many can't get past that line. They get stuck there and say, how could Christians ever embrace a song like this? He's, he's asking us to get rid of the tenets of our faith. Or is he saying, you got to start with what we got and imagine if it wasn't there. Many conclude this is an atheist hymn, a humanistic hymn. And some say people who write songs like this with interest of helping the poor are just communists and they refuse to offer them a green card. We don't have to be naive about John Lennon. John Lennon ran on momentary surges of adrenaline and some other things. His son, Sean, said this of his father on a radio documentary marking his dad's 40th birthday. He said, Dad changed his opinions every couple of years. And I'm not sure that's, I think that's maybe a good thing. We who are the people of repentance, the people who are willing to go beyond the mind that we have, should be willing to change how we think as God opens new doors. Imagine was written during a time of political and racial tension in this country and during the Vietnam War. So to imagine a world without war. When we imagine something, we're thinking beyond the reality before us. Again, Pastor Steve Stockman said this of Imagine. He said, this is not creedal. This is not theological. It's poetry. He says, Lennon's making a point not about the existence of heaven or doing something, but about doing something about the state of the world. It might even be a dig at the church for lying back and waiting for the sweet by and by rather than bringing God's kingdom here and now. Imagine. The Gospel According to the Beatles, written by Stephen Turner, says that this, he tells a story saying this song, Imagine, was inspired by a book given to Lennon by the African-American civil rights activist Dick Gregory. Some say that the inspiration was a book that Yoko Ono had called Grapefruit, where she imagined all kinds of things. Imagination, though, isn't it kind of the heart of God? Isn't it God who opens up the scriptures going, imagine light and dark. Imagine the earth and imagine the sea. Imagine the hills and imagine the valleys and the rivers. Imagine the, the green sky, the blue sky, the green hills. Imagine the sand on the beach. Isn't it God who starts with imagination? and makes it so? Isn't it God who imagines another way? Our entire relationship between God and humanity, I think, is about imagination. God giving us a vision of what could be, of how society could work. When we were slaves in Egypt, was it not God who imagined freedom? If we stay in the text, wasn't it Isaiah who imagined the, the lamb and the lion lying down together? If we stay in the text, wasn't it Micah who imagined the swords being turned into plowshares? Jeremiah imagined a brand new covenant. Ezekiel imagined a new shepherd king doing justice. God spoke to us and said, the people will see, the young people will see visions and the old people will dream dreams. Is that not imagination? Did not Jesus teach us to imagine as we pray on earth as in heaven? Wow. In the Old Testament theologian, Walter Brueggemann has been trying to get imagination back into Christian thinking for quite some time. He's written a few books, one called Hopeful Imagination, another called Prophetic Imagination. Brueggemann says this, Jesus' way of teaching through the parables was such a pastoral act of prophetic imagination 
in which he invited his community of listeners out beyond the visible realities of Roman law and in the ways in which Jewish law had grown restrictive in his time. Jesus, through the parables, imagines a different world. Brueggemann says, the practice of such poetic imagination is the most subversive, redemptive act that a leader of a faith community can undertake in the midst of exiles. And then he adds, because the work of poetic imagination holds the potential of unleashing community, a community of power and action that will finally, and that finally will not be contained by an empirical restrictions or the definitions of reality because we can imagine a different world. Imagination, though, often precedes action. We have to dream it first. We have to think about it first. 60 years ago, someone imagined the Cathedral of the Rockies in a town of 30,000 people. The Methodists imagined this place. Wow. I think Jesus invites us to imagine often. Here are these familiar words from Luke 15. Right in the middle of the Gospel of Luke, you'll know this story. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This one welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, it hit me. Who would, who, would be, who would your friends be shocked to see you eating with? I mean, this week, who would your friends be like, you, you, you had lunch with them? Maybe let that marinate a little bit. Who would your friend, because Jesus is willing to eat with sinners and tax collectors here, really big sinners, He's willing to eat with those who are outside the bounds. Who are you willing to eat with that's maybe even outside your bounds? Would that be someone who has a Confederate flag on the back of their church or back of their uh, truck? Would that be somebody with a MAGA hat or a Democrat? Who would be outside your bounds and who would your friends be shocked to see you eating with? Let's go in the story. Then Jesus told them this parable. Would you read this last verse with me? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now that's the NIV. I, there's another translation Let's put it up there. Imagine one of you has 100 sheep and loses one. That's a new translation. That's the DRSV, Dwayne's Revised Standard Version. <laughs> so we're working on that one. But doesn't Jesus say, suppose? Imagine that you're a shepherd. Now that was not hard for Jesus' crowd. Imagine you're a shepherd. They saw shepherds. They had been shepherds as they grew up. Maybe they had been shepherds for the family. Imagine you're a shepherd. Some of them are remembering. Some of them are going, oh yeah, I've seen shepherds. I can do that. I can imagine myself as a shepherd. Imagine you're a shepherd with 100 sheep and at the end of the day, as you're ready to hand them back to the owner, you go, 99? Hmm. Wouldn't you go after the one that's lost? Search for them until you find them. Put them on your shoulders. Bring them back and then call together your friends and say, the lost has been found. And wouldn't you celebrate? Jesus says to us, can you imagine God is paying attention at this level? God's not like a parent with four children that comes home from vacation and goes, well, we got three of four. That's pretty good. He says, imagine that God's like a parent with a hundred children and they lose one and they search for the one that's lost. Wow. And then Jesus, I think, blows their mind because he pushes further and says, imagine that you're a woman. And I think most of the crowd went, what? 
He says, imagine you're a woman who has 10 coins. So you're an empowered woman. So I, I think the minds were blowing all over the place in the men in the crowd. Like, do you want me to think of myself as a woman? And Jesus says, imagine you're a woman who has 10 coins and you lost one in your house. We've all lost things outside of the house, on a trail, on a trip. We've lost things as we've traveled, but we, we've also lost things in our house. You drove home, you know the car's there, you know the keys are there, but they cannot be found. You've had that moment. I've had that moment. I often say, okay, Kathy, where'd you put them? <laughs> it's frustrating. And he says, wouldn't you like put up as much light as possible and search in the house until you find the lost. And when you found the lost, won't you call your friends together and say, rejoice with me, the lost has been found. And then he adds, this is how heaven works. There's great rejoicing in heaven when repentance takes place. Now think about that. He just also invited us to imagine repentance in a way we, we don't think of repentance. We think of repentance as walking the front aisle, kneeling down and, and saying, God, I'm a sinner. He says, sometimes you don't even know you're lost. I mean, does a coin know it's lost? It's in the house. He says to the religious crowd, you are religious people and you don't even understand that you're lost because you're working hard at religion. And sometimes as you work hard at religion, you get lost in the house. And God will still search for you. And God will find you. And God will celebrate that you, even though you got lost in religion, you've been found. And then Jesus says, imagine you're a parent with two children. And the youngest child says to you, I wish you were dead. Because kids can say things like that. I wish you were dead because then I could live the way I want. I wouldn't have to put up with your rules and your expectations, your religion. I'd like to live my life. And then there's this beautiful line in the text that says, the parent divides their life between their children. I think that's the best definition of parenting in the scripture. We divide our life among our children. And the youngest child takes this newfound inheritance and has a great time for a season. It says wild living. They live wildly for a season, and then it's all gone. Like sand through our hands. But they come to their senses. They get a job, even though famine hits the land and things get worse. I've run out of resources and now the land's in crisis. They say, in the midst of that, look, this, this is a kid with resources. They get a job. They get themselves hired to feed the pigs. And they feed the pigs and hunger for the food that's being given to the pigs. I don't care what culture you go to and see pigs being fed. We never give the pigs the best stuff. And they're hungering for what's being given and then they get it. You know, I grew up in abundance. This is scarcity. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say I've sinned against heaven and against you. Don't call me a child, but, but treat me like a servant. And so they begin the long journey home. And the parent sees them. You know, sometimes you recognize the shape of your kid at a distance, the walk of your kid. And they run to them and they welcome them. They hug them and they, they, they yell back to the house, bring some clean clothes for this kid. Bring, bring a robe for them. Put some shoes on their feet. Give them a ring so they can do business. Kill the fatted calf. Call the community together. Let's celebrate. For the lost has been found. The, the dead is alive. Jesus says, imagine God who let you get lost. Imagine God who let you walk away from it all. Imagine God who let you curse his name. Imagine God who waits patiently for you to come home. And when you come home, runs to you, not to say, I told you so, 
but to embrace you and say, welcome home. Imagine repentance that maybe doesn't even look like repentance. But we remember it's a story of two, son, two children, and so the, the, the older child is not at the party, and the older child hears music and dancing and asks what's going on, and they say, well, your, your sibling has come home, and there's a party, the fatted calf's been killed, the community's called together, and they will not enter the party. And all of us have been the younger child. And some of us still are. And all of us have been the older child. And some of us still are. Where we wonder why God doesn't take care of us when we've done everything right. And the parent comes out and says, join the party. And the oldest one says, what have you ever done for me? <laughs> I've done the work of two. When have you ever given me even a goat so that I could have a party with my friends and you kill the fatted calf for this loser? And the father says, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Come and join the party. Your, your sibling was dead and they're alive. They were lost and they were found. Join the party. And the story ends. And we don't know what happened. Can you imagine being so faithful to God that you can't celebrate anyone else? That everyone's a sinner. Can you imagine not joining the party? Imagine all the people living for today, living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Let me give you some action steps to work on your imagination. Friends, I invite you to imagine community. You know, one of the things we lost during COVID was community. We had to. And now we live in the tension of hungering for community, but not quite knowing how to do it anymore. I describe this tension this way. We wish someone would invite us to dinner, and when someone invites us to dinner, we hope they will cancel. It's, it's the weird, it's our truth. It's the weird tension of we've lost the understanding of how to do community. And so I want to invite you to say, what, how can I build community in the church, at your job, in your world? That means sometimes taking time. Taking time to say, can we have a cup of coffee? Can we, can we get a beer? I want to hear your story. Tell me what's happening in your life. I don't think I know you. Can I, can I get to know you? Tell me more. This week, uh, there were a number of appointments on my schedule, but during one of them, I, I, I said to the person, tell me why you're here today. And they said, because you asked. You said, if you hadn't heard my story, I should show up, and here I am. <laughs> it was great. It was great. But it takes time, time to listen, time to share. Take the time to create community. Maybe even today, just stay a few minutes and, and celebrate these folks as they head into new ministry. Say thank you. Even if you weren't here when they led ministry, come back, we've got food, we got, get a cup of coffee. Imagine growth. What would it look like to take charge of your own spiritual journey, whether that's joining a Sunday school group or, or, or starting a small group, the men's group here just celebrated one year, one year uh, together on Saturday mornings. You may go, I didn't know we had a men's group. Every Saturday morning, there's a group of about 20-some 
guys that gather, uh, usually out here in the classroom, in the hallway. Once a month we have breakfast. I'm here once a month when we have breakfast. <laughs> Food motivates. But, um, you know, maybe that's a group you would want to be a part of. It's 8.30 on Saturday morning. Come to the front door and you can get in. If you want to start a group, see Pastor Irene. Talk to her. She may be able to help you say, yeah, we can help you do that. Imagine serving, whether it's friendship feast or food pantry or children's ministry or music ministry or youth ministry. Where is your place of service? One of the ways I've tried to make the food pantry just normal in my life every week when I shop for groceries for my family, whatever's on sale, I just get extra and put it in the box for the food pantry. If it's a good deal for me, it's a good deal for them. And so I just try to make that normal, that as I've, I gotta feed my family, I can feed somebody else's. Even if it's just one box of cereal or two cans of soup, just, add, just make it a norm that you bring every week and put it in one of the boxes for the food pantry. Imagine. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you that you are a God of imagination, that you could imagine a world where we were, were a part of it, where we were your hands and feet. I'm sure that had to, that had to blow some people's mind, that you could work through your creation to bring a little heaven on earth. Wow. We can imagine it. We can dream it. And we can do it. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Imagine all the people in the world. Well, thanks for listening to the All Means All podcast. Remember, you, you are loved and you matter to God and to me. And I hope you'll take these times, not whether you're walking or going to work or whether you're hiking the hill, hills here in Boise or maybe you're somewhere else in the world and you found us, know that you're part of the church and God's created you to make a difference. So find a place to serve right where you are. Find a place to care for others in need. Find a place to take care of yourself. Remember, love God is... Uh, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors, you love yourself. Blessings.